Thank you very much, and thank you all for having me here today. It's certainly a privilege. Um, I was asked a few times over the last couple of weeks, you know, have you written anything yet? What are you going to say? Um, and, and I said to myself, I'm not going to write a thing because the last four years of my life has been unscripted. And every day is a different story. Every day had its own narrative. And I said it would be an injustice just to write stuff down and just come in here and just um, spew a bunch of rhetoric or things I felt two weeks ago when I was writing something. And I just wanted to kind of just speak from my heart a little bit and tell you the good, the bad, the ugly. And not so much, you know, give you a play-by-play -play of the four years, but to kind of lend some hope, I guess. Um, and I'm sure most of you have uh, seen the movie Shawshank Redemption. And there's a part in that movie when Andy Dufresne is talking about hope and Red said to him, let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. And that is absolutely right. Because for four years of my life, that's all I really had to go off of was was, was hope, basically, that things would improve, that things would get better, that my daughter and then eventually my son could have, you know, a household that was happy, normal, healthy, that, let's be honest, no household is ever normal, but in our, in your own family way, in your own, um, you know, yes, pretty much. So, it was, it, it was an, an amazing tumultuous ride, and it's an amazing story I can tell. And I remember the day it kind of first started happening. And I apologize, but, you know, we were out in uh, San Francisco, and my parents had uh, come out to visit us, and, you know, they had never been to California. And we wanted to take them out there to uh, kind of show them Golden Gate Bridge, all that good stuff, have them chow down to delis and, you know, sourdough, beyond belief. <laughs> And, and our little daughter at the time was four, four months old, just about four months old, and, and there was just a change in Amanda, and there was just something that was very different, and I started seeing it from then, when my parents were worried, and I was worried, but, and I remember, you know, being in the hotel in, in, in San Francisco, we were very high up, it was like 30th floor or something, and, and our daughter was sleeping, and, Amanda and I were sleeping, and I remember her telling me, she's like, I just want to just throw Sophia off the balcony. And having no mental health experience in my life, really never having anyone in my life that had, you know, for the most part, any large level of mental illness, of course, being a dad and a husband, I was very concerned. Um, but, and it, and it didn't get any better, and so, Based off, you know, having the opportunity, we had to figure out what was wrong. And, you know, Amanda was diagnosed with postpartum depression. And a very brave woman, she fought through it. Each day, you know, there was a challenge and struggles, but my job was just to be there for her. My job was to be there for our daughter at all times. And it was very difficult and very scary for me because I traveled to work. Mm. You know, typically two, three nights a week for my job. And I felt so vulnerable on the road that I was hoping my daughter was in good hands. And I remember there's times I had to cancel business trips because Amanda was just not in a good place. And I had to put my daughter first and my wife first before being on the road and trying to make money and advance my career. Um, and as, as time went on, she continually had the postpartum and things would, you know, there'd be good weeks, there'd be good days, there'd be bad weeks, there'd be bad days. And, Again, such a brave woman, she always put herself out there to, you know, whether it was a therapist or nurses or her midwife or whatever it was, our friend, uh, who's a doula, who has a lot of medical experience. Um, there was all these different avenues. We were always trying to find different options. Um, and as time went on, um, it got worse at times, and things continually got worse. And there was this really a dynamic that was it felt like we were separated in a lot of ways, emotionally, physically, mentally, because Amanda was really on her own island sometimes. And it started out as days, and then sometimes went into weeks. And as Sophia got older, Amanda did not get better. And we, there was something we had to figure out. And there was something that was driving our family apart that 
was not healthy for our child, was not healthy for myself, and of course, ultimately, you know, was not healthy for Amanda. So eventually, she was diagnosed with PMDD, and it was a blessing in disguise in a lot of ways, because we at least knew now what the problem was. You know, we at least knew what some basic treatment options were, medication, etc., exercise, good diet, all that stuff you hear all the time. You know, go out and do yoga, go out and do this. That's great. But at the end of the day, when someone doesn't want to get out of bed and pull the covers over their head, they're not about to do yoga anytime soon. So the alternative, you know, was to manage. And that's all I could do. And some days I couldn't manage. I'm a human, I'm a human being. Work a lot of hours, gave it all to my daughter, gave it all to my wife. In those days, I was taxed too. And I just, it was extremely, extremely difficult for me to carry on a lot of days. And those days I wanted to give up, those days I couldn't fight anymore. And for a partner, and me being a, a man's man, it's very difficult. All my guy friends, their wives don't have PMDD. Their wives might have suffered from postpartum for a month or two, and they came out of it. They were fine. And, and it was a challenge for me to actually capture the right people to associate with, to talk to about this. And I leaned on anyone that would listen. Probably people I shouldn't have leaned on. But it was, it was an outlet for me. It was something that I needed to just have anyone just listen and try to understand. I remember being away in October of 13, went away for guys weekend for a college football game and we were in New Orleans, having a great time down on Bourbon Street, drinking probably more than what I should have, kind of releasing some tension I had and you know at home and, and, and you know and Amanda, you know, had a pretty good weekend up until that Sunday night. I was watching my Red Sox in the World Series play and I was with my buddy at the bar and and I remember being on the phone for an hour and a half just talking her down. I remember these moments. I, re I can recount almost every one of these moments of moments of significance, I like to call them, that were really moments that you'll never forget. Not the day to day, pull the covers over the head, but really the moments that you ask yourself, can I do this anymore as a partner? Am I, am I, am I wired? Am I built? Am I strong enough to do this? And there were times I break down. And you know, what I'm about to reveal is something I've never told Amanda or my wife. I literally carved in my head, built in my head, a, a place of refuge. That Amanda would, maybe her refuge was to be in the closet for six hours, because she couldn't deal. My refuge was my place in my head of like, dying in just knowing that, all right, I don't have to deal with this anymore. I can't deal with this anymore. I don't have the bandwidth to deal with this anymore. So the place I built in my head was, you know, beautiful beach, you know, beautiful island, just by myself, and and just not having to deal with a, with someone I love dearly, and someone that you marry, and you don't sign up for this stuff, and you don't understand this stuff. And everyone says that marriage, you know, through sickness and health. Yeah, well, you don't think of this. You think of maybe a cold. You think of a broken leg. You think of maybe cancer one day when you're 70 years old, or Alzheimer's, or you think of that stuff. You don't think of of a mental illness having a stranglehold and absolutely crippling your family, especially when your wife that you met did not have a mental illness when you met her and you were courting and dating and proposing and planning the wedding. Stuff didn't exist and all of a sudden you're dealt a hand you were never expecting. And you know what? Some people would say, Mark, that's life. It is what it is. You know, things can happen. You know, I remember our son after he was born two days had to get admitted to the NICU for a week. I'll tell you right now, that was scary. There was PMDD made my son in the NICU look like a walk in the park. It really did. And our son was never in grave danger, but it was still a pretty major thing, he, why he was in the NICU. But it was a basic walk in the park versus what we had to deal with. It was kind of like a vacation. I remember being at the hotel across the street from the hospital with my daughter, and I'm like, oh, we'll see Mommy and Matthew in the morning. I'm like, he's gonna be fine. And you know, you feel so you know, helpless seeing your son in the NICU, but there was nothing, I've never felt more helpless in my life than when Amanda was in the, in, the, in the thrust of PMDD at the peak of it, at the essence of it, in those two weeks, and it eventually evolves into two weeks a month. Two weeks. Being a single dad on the weekends, you know, and figuring out what am I gonna do now, you know, and learning how to, you know, do my daughter's hair, and 
learning, you know, different places to take him and making excuses why Amanda wasn't FaceTiming. You know, when my parents wanted to FaceTime him. I said, Amanda's disrupting, you know, she's out right now running an errand. I knew who she was, I knew what was going on. And I know, no matter how bad I had it, it was 10 times worse for her, and I know that. I know she did not want to be that person. She had no control over it. It was devastating to her. It was devastating to our family. It was devastating on levels you could never imagine if you've never had to have a partner with PMDD. So, as, as time continued to evolve, I remember this past March, I had another guys weekend, and before you say, Mark, you go to a lot of guys weekends. No, it's just one a year. <laughs> um, I remember being in March in Vegas, and the annual trip I go to with my friends, and, and I'm, I said, I'm taking control of this before I went away. I said, I am having her mom stay with us. I took control. I said, I'm not having to stay control anymore. I'm going out for once, I need to go enjoy myself. I need to, again, let off steam, have a good time. But there's so many intangibles that come along with, you know, people have triggers in their lives, you know, and God love her mom. Her mom's a trigger <laughs> And I said to myself, I am at a loss, and it, it, I just don't know where to turn anymore. And it eventually got to the point through, through a lot of therapy and through a lot of, people that thought they understood PMDD, and through a lot of people that just lent their support, through a lot of people that said to me, Mark, you spoil her. You spoil her, Mark. No, I, I spoil her with love, and I spoil her with tenderness, and I spoil her with understanding. Um, and you can't change who you are in doing that. You, you can't. You can't change who you are as a person and how I was raised, you know, to be, you know, to be loving, to be tender, to be kind and understanding. But I also inside, I was dying inside. I was absolutely dying inside, trying to find energy to pull myself up, find energy to, you know, to do a little bit more with my children when I had nothing left in the tank, when Amanda couldn't do it. Um, and it got more challenging as my son was born. I had two children and two weekends a month that she was in a rough place. And it was so hard that there was times that we fought because I lashed out at her when she didn't deserve it. And she would always say to me, you know, you need to learn how to manage me when I get like this. Well, I'm not a doctor. I've never met anyone with BMDD before. I'm doing the best I can. And there's many, many times I felt like I failed her and I failed our children. I really, really did. I still feel that way to this day sometimes because I could have reacted better. Our little daughter could have maybe not seen us yell as much. And, but all I can do now is, is move forward. She had her hysterectomy in May. She's been doing very, very well. And whatever the solution is or for any of you, or whether it's a God you believe in, or a higher, a higher power, or whatever it is, just continue to believe that there is an end game, continue to believe that there's opportunity ahead. Always try to remember why you fell in love with that person and please know that person still exists mm -hmm. at the core. And that's what kept me going. I knew who Amanda was and people would tell me, Mark, just end it. My friends are like, why are you still marrying her? Like, you, you don't deserve this, Mark. You don't deserve this, Mark. And I heard that all the time. And you know what? I didn't deserve it. But I was given a hand. I was dealt the hand and I played the hand. And hopefully now, you know, as things continue to progress, our family is in a better place. And I would encourage all of you that are partners out there or, or any of you that have PMDD, there's hope. There is hope. And like I said at the beginning, the quote Red made, well, when Andy escaped prison, he wrote Red, if you remember, and he goes, remember Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Mm. Thank you.